Thanks for uh, joining me this morning. Um, I know Kevin was supposed to be here. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make it, but a much better looking alternative has stood in, in his place. Um, my name is Richard Smith. I'm also one of the co-founders here at Refract. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be putting forward the case for coaching and uh, some tips around creating a coaching culture in your organization. Uh, at the end of the uh, seminar, if you do want a copy of the slides, just come up and see me, give me a, a business card. We'll make sure that we uh, get those out to you at the, uh, at the end of the show. So um, there's a definite shift that's been happening over the past 12 months uh, in the industry, which suggests that the whole uh, culture of coach, uh, coaching, it's a moving needle. Um, we actually call this the, the death of the annual appraisal. I think we're all pretty familiar with this. It's the sort of long-standing, dreaded, once a year sit down with your manager, usually happens on the week of the Christmas party. Um, and the likes of Adobe, IBM, Accenture, uh, many others, they're all sort of moving away from this quite outdated approach to moving towards a, a less formal but uh, much more frequent uh, approach to feedback. In Adobe's case, um, the idea here is to give people the information and the feedback when they need it, rather than months after those teachable moments have passed. Um, sort of hints at the, the, the fact that feedback is far less effective um, when it's lost in the memory or, or no longer relevant. And actually at Refract, we did our own poll on this, uh, on this shift, um, and it provided some quite interesting results. So what we found was that 66% of people who took part in the survey, um, they actually uh, identified uh, that they, they do conduct annual appraisals. However, the vast majority of those actually rated them as completely ineffective. 60% predicted that they would have a shift in importance of coaching over the next 12 months. However, they felt that in order for them to do that, a couple of things needed to change. First of all, they felt their managers would need to have more training in being better coaches and being able to give better feedback. And secondly, they felt that the organization still had some way to go in putting much more of an importance of, of moving to a, a coaching culture. What I'm going to be doing is putting forward a few studies uh, and, and uh, reports to, to build the case for coaching and why coaching can be so effective. Um, however, it's important just to kind of distinguish um, the difference between coaching and feedback because we often hear these two words uh, as a collective. Um, feedback could be, uh, I guess, uh, identified as, as praise, ideas, constructive rationale. Um, think of feedback as a, as a statement based on performance that's happened in the past. Coaching, on the, on the other hand, more, is more questions, self-reflection, uh, collaboration. It's looking forward to what can be done in the future uh, rather than feedback on what's, what, what's, uh, what's already happened. It's important to say, however, that neither of these are... It's, ne it's ne never an either-or scenario with these two. Um, they are uh, most effective when they're actually delivered as a collective. So... Um, What's forcing this cultural shift then of, of, of people moving to a more uh, uh, a system of more uh, frequent feedback? Well, a lot of this is driven by the millennial workforce um, who are actually being proven to demand feedback um, a lot more frequently. Harvard Business School carried out this study which looked at how often employees wanted feedback from managers and they actually identified that millennials uh, prefer feedback on a monthly basis which is quite a stark contrast to um, the older uh, workforce who preferred feedback on a, on a much less frequent basis. Looking deeper into this study, uh, what we found was that um, people actually prefer negative feedback more and more uh, because they identify it as actually helping, people, hel helping themselves improve their performance. And this is actually twice as much as people prefer getting uh, positive feedback. The challenge that we have with this is that we're only uh, ambivalent to receiving, uh, sorry, to delivering praise. Nobody likes to give negative feedback um, despite people's obvious desire to receive more and more of it. So there's a clear disconnect there between the demand to receive uh, negative feedback but the reluctance to actually give it. However, this does definitely vary between individuals because there's a strong correlation between how confident an individual is and how much they prefer to receive that negative feedback. Uh, so, as managers, we need to think about before we actually deliver that uh, deliver that feedback. Um, it has to be personalised to the relevant confidence levels of the individual. Um, so, you know, we, we need to look at the the behavioural profile of that person. Are they uh, how how acceptant are they going to be to receiving negative feedback, and and how can we make sure that's deli delivered in the right proportions? 
So going kind of deeper into looking at the, the, the real case for, for, for coaching in, uh, in industry, um, this was a study which looked at the impact of not just feedback, but also people um, self-reflecting on their own performance. And this was an exercise that was carried out by um, Ghent University in 2008, which evaluated performances of four groups of employees from different organizations carrying out a series of work-related tasks. Um, both of these tasks were carried out twice, and between each task, they were separated firstly by the employees uh, receiving no feedback and no reflection. The second time around, they would receive feedback but wouldn't have that time to reflect. Uh, thirdly, um, they would receive feedback and time to self-reflect. And then finally, uh, they would receive no feedback, but they would be able to reflect on their performance. So all four of those variations. And this is just an example of the kind of uh, output that the, uh, the participants received. Um, so this report would first of all show the cognitive skill being measured. Uh, it would also show what made people an expert in each of those skills. And finally, uh, it would show how each participant performed in that particular, uh, against that particular skill. The study's results highlighted the clear and massive impact on the, uh, on the importance of receiving feedback between each task. And although self-reflection was important, uh, delivered by itself, uh, having self-reflection uh, self with no feedback wasn't hugely impactful. Um, however, by far and away, the biggest impact was when uh, the participants received feedback and also had the time to self-reflect on their performance. So for each industry and role, um, you know, we need to think how coaching will, of course, have different applications. And here at Refract, we work across many sectors, sales, customer service, managerial development. Um, However, I do want to focus on uh, sales as one example of where we're really seeing a really strong case for, for coaching being built. So let's look at the case for sales coaching. Um, well, a Forbes Insight report from last year uh, identified that nearly three quarters of uh, top companies identified that coaching or mentoring of their sales reps as the most important function uh, frontline managers play. And this corporate executive board study from uh, 2014 provided some pretty extraordinary st statistics on the impact of coaching within a sales team. Uh, and the results are, are somewhat dramatic. So it actually found that um, effective coaching can increase overall sales team performance by 19%. Um, however, what it did also identify was that the performance was largely uh, driven by the caliber of coach. Uh, uh, who was working with the sales rep and reps that had those much higher caliber of coaches uh, achieved 8% higher revenues over those with uh, a lesser caliber. And the statistics on the positive uh, output coaching can bring is highlighted even further um, when they actually found out that uh, reps who received just three hours of coaching per month exceeded their goals by 7%, boosted their, their sales by 25%, and probably most startlingly increased their average close rate by 70%. So what this is proving is that for a very small investment in time, actually returns some quite significant uh, results. Yet despite the clear statistics on the, the very significant and positive performance uh, impact of coaching, why is it still so broken? Well, um, the Sales Manager Association discovered that in actual fact, nearly three quarters of managers spend just less than 5% of their time coaching their entire team. So if you kind of work that out in your head, that actually amounts to around about an hour and a half of coaching an entire sales team across a working week. And it, it does beg the question, in, in which other profession would it be acceptable to spend just 5% of your time on the most important role that your job entails? But perhaps this slide can start to bring some answers to uh, the real challenges faced by managers when it comes to coaching. And it's, it's actually so much more than just a time issue. We're finding that the number of individuals per manager has increased uh, from six to eight since 2010. Um, and we're seeing that also the, the average tenure of employees uh, has also gone down significantly. Um, so what that means is that we're actually spending more time with more reps, we're spending more time recruiting, doing that initial upskilling, onboarding, rather than that continuous coaching approach to existing kind of longer term committed individuals. And what are the, what are the other reasons for why sales coaching is not what it should be? Uh, well, nearly half of these reasons behind the lack of coaching stems from the manager's uh, lack of skill set and being effective at coaching. 
Um, and this is a very important point. Very few managers are actually taught how to coach. Coaching in itself is not an inherent skill that we just pick up along the way. Um, it's often something that needs to be taught. And if we consider maybe from a sales team ex uh, 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 example, you might have a, a senior rep, uh, they've been a high performer, they've maybe a, a good team player. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be effective at upskilling others or coaching others. And so we need to, um, we need to consider uh, you know, why uh, the, you know, getting the right individuals in those positions and then upskilling them accordingly. And Scott Edinger from Forbes um, actually painted quite a bleak picture uh, from the organization's perspective at why managers are so uh, tied up and, or, and not giving their time and effort to coaching. And he stated that as managers, we're just too focused in reports, numbers, KPIs, graphs, all of these sort of short-term goals and, and rather than the longer-term development of individuals. We're, we're doing too much admin as managers rather than actually spending more time uh, actually developing our staff. So after the compelling case that I've put forward by coaching, you know, with all the studies highlighting the impact it's having, the fact is employees, we want feedback more and more. And there is a, a nod from the organization and acknowledgement that we, we do want to move to a more frequent approach to coaching. Um, simply, there's still not the commitment to time or even quality of coaching to make coaching an effective uh, embedded process within the business. So I've put forward the case there for coaching. I now just want to move on to some uh, tips and tricks of, of how to actually go about uh, creating a coaching culture in your business. And um, we'll, we'll simply start with this uh, big obje objection that we're finding of this lack of skill set. So you know, what I would say is that we need to invest uh, more time and money to make managers good coaches. Um, you know, we, we spend thousands of pounds on training our staff or recruiting staff. Why not spend some of that money on training, whether it's internal or external, on, on helping our managers be more effective at coaching and seeing that the positive ROI that that can bring on a longer term basis. However, it's important when we uh, think about time spent coaching uh, employees, we need to, uh, we need to actually consider that the following is that coaching in itself um, isn't democratic and actually the biggest impact of coaching is in that, that middle, larger portion of employees, that kind of middle of the road employees, if you like. Um, it's actually proven that coaching has quite a negligible impact on the, the lowest or, or, or top performing, uh, top performing employees. Um, however, what this does actually, uh, what coaching actually helps with this basis is that it helps us identify which of those individuals aren't coachable, uh, who are continually uh, low performing. There's no chance of them ever really uh, developing their skills. And so it also, coaching helps us understand which reps we may want to coach out of the business uh, as quick as possible. Another tip on how to create a coaching culture is actually making this a measurable KPI. So, you know, we, we have so many KPIs as manager, managers, some far more meaningless than others. Um, so why not make the most important function, for example, a sales manager has to play, um, an actual measurable, uh, a measurable KPI that, they're, that, that um, they can be assessed on. So you can look at um, how much time managers are spending coaching their teams per week, um, and we can look at how effective that coaching has been as well. And this is how some of our clients at Refract are using us to actually provide that visual uh, dashboard of which managers are coaching, who's, uh, whose teams are developing faster than others, and, and, uh, and, and how often that coaching is taking place. The next tip on how to create a coaching culture is to embrace peer learning. So what can your more experienced members of, uh, of, of, of staff, how can you actually get them um, brought into the, the, the realm of coaching and passing on their wisdom to the less experienced or less able members of uh, staff. So, you know, if you think about high performing employees love the kind of the kudos of, of, of passing on their knowledge and wisdom, um, how we recommend you do it is transform these individuals into player coaches. If you think of them as sporting analogy, so if you give them the responsibility to spend time coaching their peers, sharing their ideas, giving feedback, even better, incentivize those player coaches to do so. You could build the, the player coach uh, role into your uh, career ladder or your uh, career progression model. Um, so it's almost like prove yourself as a, as a good player coach and that will aid your progression to more senior uh, positions in the business. Um, there is a little caveat with this point though. You need to ensure you've got the right people in those positions because um, people who are maybe very competitive and are reluctant to pass on knowledge and, and ideas are, are not going to be good fits for those player coach roles. Next tip, um, share best practice. So this could be in the form of like bite-sized learning examples. 
where you can get employees to access those on demand and, and this removes the necessity to have you sit one-on-one -on -one with those individuals and tell them uh, what they should be aspiring to. You can actually show them, um, you know, give them the ideas of what those best practice examples look like. Um, so you'll, if you have this on your on onboarding process, you give people access to, to getting visual uh, identity of what best practice looks like and, 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 and not going down the wrong path. Another tip on creating a coaching culture would be to make um, reps accountable for their own uh, development. So you could encourage your employees to ask for help. So an example of this could be setting an objective, maybe once a week on a Monday morning, uh, getting each employee to ask you for ideas or an experience that they had last week and how best to deal with that, uh, uh, that, uh, that scenario if they come across it again. Um, so making them, uh, making them more accountable for their own personal development um, will we'll get them bought into this as a, as a, as a common uh, valuable activity. Um, I call this the inbound coaching approach. As managers, there's so much pressure on us being outbound coaches, always the responsibility for us telling our staff what they could be better at. Um, actually, moving to this inbound approach, getting people to ask you or force them to ask you for help in certain areas will, will save time, but also make your, your coaching and feedback much more focused to the areas that you know that that individual needs support in. And then finally, it would be remiss of me not to um, talk about how technology can support coaching in this process. And this is uh, how we are doing at Refract, where uh, we have a, a platform that allows uh, companies to add tags or coachable moments against video or audio uh, capture. Uh, that allows um, individuals to skip between those key moments, receive feedback in an engaging, uh, focused format, and then sharing best practice examples to other members of the team as well. Thanks very much for everyone. Uh, as mentioned, if you uh, do want a copy of the slides, come and see me, give me a business card, we'll make sure that uh, we get that to you after the, sh after the seminar. Cheers.